Rescue me, O oh God. I am in deep trouble. Rush to my aid, for only you can help and save me, O oh Lord. Don't delay. If David's prayer of desperation in Psalm 70 reminds you of your devotional life, you will want to stay tuned because you may be in the danger zone. Welcome to Crosstalk, a Christian podcast whose goal is for us to encourage each other to not only increase our knowledge of the Bible, but to take the next step beyond information into transformation. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life into all our lives. I'm Brian French. Today, Dr. Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkiss, and Nathan Norman continue their discussion through the book of James by looking at James chapter 1, verses 12 to 15. If you have a Bible handy, turn to James chapter 1, verses 12 to 15, as we join their discussion. David was a man of God. But based on what we just heard, there were times in his life when he reached the end of his rope. This is a prayer of a godly man during a time of overwhelming stress. Nathan, Vicki, have you ever found yourself in an overwhelming situation? I went through one very recently that I bet a lot of people have gone through in the year 2020, the year we're recording this. My mother is in a nursing home, Hmm. and she had a very bad bacterial infection, and then we found out she had COVID-19. No no one is allowed on the campus there to visit. So my mother has dementia. She knows me, but she has dementia. She gets Mm -hmm. confused. And they moved her and isolated her in a room that she didn't recognize. She didn't know anybody. I knew she was alone. And I know the importance of being hugged. Mm. And, And there was nobody there to comfort her or hold her. The best my brother and I could do is we could Zoom with her. She We just left her computer on and my brother could remotely log in. Mm-hmm. But it was it. Lots of people are going through that. And yeah. I thought I may never see my mother again. She recovered. But I went through mm-hmm. my head of saying goodbye to my mother without ever seeing yeah. her again. That's that's overwhelming. That is that is. Yeah, I know uh, for us, 2019 was an incredibly rough year. Uh, it started out uh, pretty well. And then I think uh, at the end of January, we started losing friends and family members, whether from church or uh, mm-hmm. our own uh, personal friends or family members. And by the time 2019 ended, uh, literally on uh, New Year's Eve, uh, we had uh, lost 20 people. Oh, my. And uh, Wow uncles and uh, grandparents and friends and leaders at the church, uh, uh, single moms who uh, passed away and left their, uh, uh, their children without parents. And uh, it, it, was, it was incredibly rough because we were running from one situation to another. We weren't able to make it to all the funerals. We were doing some of the funerals, my wife and mm-hmm. I. And, and it is it was utterly exhausting. And uh, in the midst of that, we had just moved into a uh, very old 120 uh, year old farmhouse and uh, <laughs> needed all kinds of renovations and updates. And the thing was falling apart. And sometimes the electricity worked and sometimes it didn't. And sometimes the plumbing was going out. And uh, yeah, it was it, it was utterly exhausting. Oh, Nathan. Yeah. Well, there are times I think everyone goes through seasons of great difficulty. In a sense, life is sometimes like the weather. Well, many days are beautiful and sunny. Others are overcast and gloomy, and occasionally they become overwhelming. It's like a devastating hurricane arrives and life can seem unbearable. Mm. It has for us, and it certainly did for the recipients of this letter we're studying, the sent by James, because he sent them to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. So as we've seen before, these were refugees, people who, because of their faith, were driven out of their homes. They were isolated from their families, from their businesses, under enormous pressure. In James chapter 1, the author is telling these people, giving them help by helping them reframe their perspective on life. He began by telling them they can remain positive in spite of these difficulties because God is using these challenges of life to help them grow spiritually. 
And then he warned us all not to allow our financial situation and during these difficult times to warp our spiritual self-image. Our value is found in him, not our wallet. But now, starting in verse 12, James sounds an alarm. It seems that when we are in a season of stress, we're in a spiritual danger zone. Look at what he says in verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. <laughs> this is hurricane season. This is when life becomes almost unbearable. Not every day, but there are times. And in those times, he says, hang in there, because having stood the test, you will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. But you have to hang on. The implication is that hurricane seasons can separate us from God. It doesn't mean they will, of course, but they could. Because it's when the pressures of life become unbearable and everything begins to stack up against us. That's when we feel the pressure of maybe taking a shortcut through sin to try and alleviate the problem. We are tempted to make compromises, moral compromises, in an attempt to ease the pain. Somebody once told me that a person's character is revealed by what they do when no one's looking. Yeah, I'm not sure that's true. I think the real test of character is what you choose to do when the pressure is on. Hmm. Difficult times, I think, are a stress test of our character and of our faith. It's when we can't pay our mortgage, when we're having serious marriage struggles, or your child was killed in a drive-by shooting. That's when you're more likely to lie on your income tax. Look twice at another man or woman, or just disappear into a bottle of bourbon. Yeah, you know, without naming names, of course, can you think of examples of sinful choices that people have made because of the pressures of life? When the pressures of life seemed so overwhelming, they decided to find an escape into sin? Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, there's lots of examples. It's, uh, it's hard to uh, even put them all out of mind. My... Uh, I have a, a man I know, a friend, uh, who, as their family was going into financial trouble, uh, was working on the road and had been clean from uh, drugs for, for a decade. And as the financial stress was building and building, uh, he went back. Yeah. He went back to the drugs. And, and unfortunately, it, uh, it tore his family apart, oh. um, tore his marriage apart, and, uh, and tore him away from his own kids. It, uh, it was, it was gruesome. It was ugly to see. And, mm -hmm. and the hard thing is he knew what was happening and it's part of him wanted to stop. Part of him didn't. Mm. Yeah. I've heard a lot of stories in this COVID-19 of people responding with uh, abuse of alcohol. Yeah. It's, uh, it's radically increasing. I would add Rocky Road ice cream to that. One. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the COVID-15, it's not 19, it's yeah. 15, 15 pounds everybody's put that's on. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. That's, well, <laughs> no, that's true. And well, I mean, uh, from a pastoral perspective, uh, I've had so many conversations with uh, marriages that are on the rocks, that are in trouble. Uh, and I constantly, almost every Sunday, remind people everything you're feeling is amplified because of this pandemic that's going on. Yep. And uh, it's a bad time to make decisions. Uh, there have been folks within uh, the broader community that I've been talking with that they're going through divorce. And uh, and the reason, they, they don't have really any reason. It, it's uh, it's hard. It's almost they're they're trying to escape the current situation and the national devastation we're going through. And the closest thing they can figure is if you know we change partners or something, maybe that will change anything. And and of course the reality is that it won't. Uh, it's not going to help. It's just going to compound problems down the road. But but there's been a lot of couples who otherwise have generally healthy marriages who are are now starting to talk about divorce. Yeah. So how do we survive hurricane season? I mean, all of us are either in or will be in a time of enormous stress in our life. How do we make sure that those times that, that we don't, in, during those times, that we don't succumb to the temptation which will come to us? Well, James gives us two answers in this passage. And this week, we're just going to look at the first one. And his first answer comes in verse 13, hmm. when he says, so when tempted, 
no one should say, God is tempting me. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. In times of great stress, how do even good Christians fall into sin? The necessary step for us to slip into a sin that we obviously know is wrong is if we are able to rationalize it to ourselves. We, we rationalize it. We try to give ourselves excuses for our behavior. We say to ourselves, I have no choice. It's not my fault. <laughs> One thing I am sure of is that there is no sin too great for us to rationalize. We're all able to give excuses for our actions. Not only our children can do that, but we can do that. In fact, we often do as James says, no one should say God is tempting me. We often do that. <laughs> in fact, if you look back in the book of Genesis, the very first sin, you remember Adam and Eve in the garden. So before the sin, God and Eve and, and Adam were all walking together in the afternoon, having a great time, obviously sharing great love. Immediately after sin, Adam hides, God finds him and asks him what in the world went on. And you remember Adam's response? Well, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. It's not me. It's this woman. And then he goes further and says, and this woman, well, to be perfectly honest, God, you put her here. If you hadn't put her here, she wouldn't have tempted me. And I would have said, so it's not my fault. <laughs> it's her fault. And ultimately, it's your <laughs> fault, God. <laughs> and that's what we do, isn't it? If God had prevented my wife from getting sick, I, I wouldn't have strayed from my wedding vows. I mean, what choice did I have? It's been five years. Or if only God had provided a job, I wouldn't have had to steal. Or if only had God had moved the nail away from my car tire, I wouldn't have screamed at the mechanic. It's not my fault. Mm. God in his sovereignty could have changed the situation and then I wouldn't have sinned. But James doesn't buy our rationalizations. He exposes them for what they are. They are excuses. In fact, they are lies that we try to use to paper over our iniquity. Look at what he says. No one should say God is tempting me. No. Why? For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. He continues in verse 14. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. That's sobering. Did you hear what James said? That's scary. He's saying there is never a good enough reason to sin, and that the wages of sin are always death. There is never a good reason for disobedience. And in the end, as he says in verse 15, when it's full grown, it results in death. So how do we apply this? We have a temptation during times of great stress to rationalize our sinful behavior. We think we're justified. How do we help people? How can we help our friends from taking that dangerous step of beginning to rationalize sin in the midst of their stress? Any suggestions? Uh, oh my, it, it, it's incredibly hard. I mean, the reason we sin when we're in times of stress, the reasons I sin when I'm in times of stress is because it uh, more often than not uh, over promises. I feel like, well, if I yell at my family, it's going to feel good because I am frustrated. And uh, and if I uh, if I choose to uh, lie to get out of something, uh, I, I'm going to uh, get off scot-free. So it's, it's really hard to combat that because sin just, it's a phenomenal salesperson and it mm -hmm. overpromises everything. And then you get the, the box home and you open it up and you realize that this, I, I just wasted my money on a bunch of junk. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, part of it is, is uh, having a regular prayer life. Uh, if we're not having a prayer, regular mm -hmm. prayer life. And, and I would say even have a, a mentality of coming in and out of prayer on a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, we are going to be very disconnected from God. And the further we are disconnected from God, the easier it will be to rationalize our sins if we're not having a regular uh, dialogue with him. And, and the flip side of that is to read your Bible. Yep. If you're in the Bible, you're hearing from God. And, uh, and it is transforming your soul and your mind and your thought process and your pattern of belief and, uh, and your heart. Mm -hmm. And so the temptations are still there, but there's a counter voice to it. 
Sure. Uh, there's someone else saying something. You know, it's like kids with peer pressure. If you've got a whole group of teenagers and there's 12 of them saying, hey, let's go. Oh, in honor of my mom, I'm going to say, let's go jump off a bridge because my mom liked that one. If all your friends are jumping <laughs> off a bridge. Right. So so if there's 12 of your friends saying, oh, we're all going to go jump off a bridge and, uh, and and everyone's peer pressuring you to do it. You're more likely to do something foolish unless there's another voice that says, you know what, guys, this isn't the best idea. Even if you have that one other voice, you're probably not going to do it. If you have two more voices, you're, you're, you're least likely to do it. And if you have, you know, the majority of the, the kids, 11 out of 12 saying, no, this is a bad idea. We shouldn't jump off this bridge. We might get hurt and die. Uh, then you're most likely not going to do it. Well, the same thing is true with our thought pattern. If our mind is filled with the word of God and we're regularly used to going to God, uh, then we're much less likely to give in to the pull of temptation when we feel like it's going to improve our lives because we will know uh, from the Bible and experience that that it will over oversell us and uh, under deliver every single time. Yeah. And if just to build on your example metaphor that you use there, um, the, if we are in a community of people who know us and we have the freedom and we develop a relationship to be vulnerable with them. If we tell them what we're thinking, they're the ones who can also come alongside and echo God's word to us. Right. Amen. And say, don't be stupid, stupid. Um, <laughs> look what's going to happen. Uh, right. Yeah. Your the self-talk is going to end up d being very destructive. Right. And, and there are just times we can help people when they're, in stress, because we're of saying course. when people in are, are in trials, that's when they're more vulnerable. So if they don't have money or if they can't get out, we can take, I mean, this is really practical, but just take a walk with them regularly so they yeah. do get out or yeah. whatever we can do to lessen the stress. No, Amen. absolutely. Yeah. Again, as a community, rather than just talking, if we can be sensitive to their stress, there has been a death. There has been a job loss. There has been illness, all these things. So, so what can we do proactively so they can withstand the hurricanes of life? I think that is very helpful and, uh, and compassion. It's such a great example for others in the church as well as for the community. Because there will be times in life for every one of us when sin will seem to be the solution to life's problems. But it's not. Using sin to relieve stress is kind of like drinking salt water to quench your thirst. I'm told that when you get thirsty out in the ocean, the overwhelming temptation is to tell yourself, well, it wouldn't hurt to have a little drink of salt water. Look at all the water that's here. But salt water is not a solution. No, I'm told that the salt in the water only increases your thirst. So you drink more. And the more you drink, the more salt builds up in your kidneys and becomes toxic. And as your thirst grows and you drink more and more, it's not long till you have muscle cramps, dry mouth, organ failure, coma, and even death. Salt water will not solve your thirst problem. And giving it a temptation will not stop the pain that you're facing in life. Don't deceive yourself. Sin is never the solution. It's always advertised as a solution, but it never delivers. Believing our own excuses for why we should sin, if you believe them, you will only separate yourself from God. How can we ensure that today's hard times don't jeopardize our eternity? Well, the first thing James tells us to do is to refuse to rationalize those temptations. Don't rationalize sin. Resist it. So there you have it. When you are faced with the temptation to sin... And we all do want to sin. And during this COVID season, most of us feel excessive stress. Choose not to sin and don't rationalize the temptation. I trust that today's discussion of God's word has been helpful and served as an encouragement to not just be hearers of the word, but doers. Together, let's bring God's word to life, to our lives this week. The Crosstalk Podcast is a production of Crosstalk Global equipping biblical communicators so every culture hears God's voice. To find out more or to support the work of this ministry, please visit www.crosstalkglobal.org. And while you're at it, take a moment and leave us a nice review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find this show. Five-star ratings are the number one way people discover new podcasts. 
Be sure to listen next Friday as we continue our discussion of the book of James and discover how sometimes following common sense doesn't always make our lives better. Be sure to join us.